our hospital uh, began to consider that we may be having a problem with our youth and their sleep. We, start, we run a uh, large sleep center at JFK and we had uh, students come in who were complaining of sleep deprivation and fatigue. So we did an uh, initial pilot study a number of years ago and then finally uh, published our large study most recently of 3,000 students. And in that survey of 3,000 students from the Edison Township High School, we um, surveyed these children to get an idea of what their habits are with the use of their electronic media, particularly their smartphones, uh, at around and after bedtime. Well, we found out, to no one's surprise, that uh, these children are using these devices probably when we think they are or should be sleeping. Um, you know, the, the children already have a very um, shrunken sleep time to begin with. They uh, are up very early in the morning to get to school early because of busing situations, etc. They come home, I think, burdened with tremendous amounts of homework. They may have sports or have to work and family responsibilities. And then suddenly when they're done uh, with all of that and we think they're going to sleep, they're up and our data has shown that they're up texting well past bedtime. Over 50% of them are receiving texts during their sleep. And a vast majority of them complained of not getting the requisite eight hours of sleep. In fact, um, a majority of them actually started to uh, complain of what we call eveningness, which is they feel more alert at night than they do during the day. And this is something you don't want for students who are in school during the day. It is just how life is, and, and correct. I, uh, some of the surveys have shown that upwards of 65% of teenagers have smartphones in this country. So that's a staggering number. And it is the way it is, and we as parents and adults are as guilty as the children. And you know, this, this, this to me extrapolates to the adult population as well. And we didn't conduct it in the adult population, but we too are now working in well past hours when we should be sleeping. We put the phone down at the bedside, send a text, and there's a phenomenon that I like to call this anticipatory response. Um, children will send a text or send a group chat and maybe have no intention of uh, doing any more and then suddenly they get a response back. Now they feel compelled to read the response and perhaps answer the response. And then when they do these group things, they may get five responses for every one that they send out and this thing, you know, it pyramids. So yes, it is a problem for adults. It's a problem for adolescents. And we looked at it for adolescents because sleep is critical for everyone, but particularly so for adolescents, for brain development, for biological development, um, for uh, consolidating lessons learned that day in school. And when we start to interfere with that and interrupt that process, it has consequences with daytime function and activity, which our study showed. On these 3,000 students, they complained of difficulty in school, problems with concentration, difficulty staying awake. Now, in our study, we didn't do um, EEGs and look at that, but we can tell you what sleep interruption and sleep deprivation does in general. So one of the things, when we sleep at night, we go through uh, cycles. We go through light stage sleep one to, st to stages three and four deep sleep to REM sleep. And those cycles occur approximately every 90 minutes in an average person. Now what happens when you begin to interrupt those and reset those, we then find we may be deficient in certain stages of sleep. For example, if we keep interrupting before REM sleep, um, we find at the end of the day that that child or that adult now is, is REM deficient. And then the opportunity for good sleep when it comes along, we have this rebound of REM now because the brain is now saying, well, I, I need that REM back. And now we have an overwhelming REM, which can cause sleep further, now cause sleep disruption, memory, um, uh, dream enactment, really up upsets the car. So sleep is a cycle that has to be perpetuated. And interrupting that at each time prevents the brain from resetting itself, as I say, consolidating, um, allowing uh, hormone release. I mean, there are a number of hormones that are released during sleep. For example, in, ch in, in children, growth hormone is released predominantly at night. We know that if you interrupt sleep, you interrupt that cycle of growth hormone release. So all of these things are interrelated. We used to think sleep was passive. It's passive only in the sense that you're not physically moving, um, but it's quite active neurologically and metabolically. 
We wanted to look at it as, a, as to get a real significant number of students to, to, to really make it impactful in its message. And we used a number of validated questionnaires that, as I said, assessed sleepiness, assessed school performance, assessed whether you were, again, an evening or a day person, uh, and then consolidating these, these surveys to deliver a real message um, with a meaningful number that's, that reinforces what I think we all know is that this is a problem, but that's, I've had parents tell me now, now I have numbers, now I have something hard uh, and something that is impartial to show my, my child, instead of it coming, oh, that's just you, mom, and you, dad. No, this is coming from a research center, and it has maybe perhaps more weight with the child than simply a parental um, no-no. You look at it and you break it down to its, comp to, to its parts. What can we control? I, I can't control the busing system in America. Um, I'd like to think, I think schools are starting to get the message though about that. There are townships, even in New Jersey now, that are starting to start school later. So I think they're starting to understand that. There's also a push and a look at maybe perhaps cutting back homework in some townships, which I think is important. But most immediately what we can affect is our children's use of these devices. At the end of the day, uh, they are still our children, we are still the parent. And if there is a problem, uh, and, there's an, and the, the way you can tell that is, I mean, first of all, have an honest, honest discourse with your child. Um, they have to understand the, the pitfalls of this. And even a study such as ours can be broken down and explained to a child that, look, this is bad for you. And at the end of the day, if you have to, you take the phone out of the room. My daughters tell me we'd like to use it as an alarm clock, and that's fine. But if that's a problem in your house, get another alarm clock. It doesn't have to be a smartphone as an alarm clock because there's too much that comes with that potentially to interrupt the child's sleep. In our study, uh, a number of, of uh, adolescents reported that they were awakened from the sleep with text or with vibration. So it is disruptive. Some children sleep deeper than others and a vibration may not get them, but you have, that's assuming they all put the phone on the vibrate anyway. There was clearly a signal of children who were asleep reporting that their sleep was interrupted by an incoming uh, text or, or email. We had a challenge doing a study of this size. This is the largest study in this, on this topic conducted in the United States. Now, with 3,000 students, you need consent, you can imagine, parental consent, the logistics, and, 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 and Dr. O'Malley, who was a superintendent at Edison Township, was very instrumental in helping to coordinate this. So we, we wanted uh, high school students because we think that they're the ones who are most affected by the external schedule. That is, they're up earliest, earlier than middle school, they have more homework than middle school, their athletics are five, six days a week as opposed to two or three days a week. So we said, let's pick that group. And then logistically, we needed to, to um, uh, be able to implement the study. I would love very much to look at the middle school, but I would tell you the next group I, would, I think I would like to take a look at is college students. Because perhaps in college students now, they've either gotten the message and they're better about that. Or college students, remember, they have much more control of their schedule, which could be a double-edged sword. You know, they can sleep till 11 o'clock and attend their first class at one in the afternoon if they want. So is that, that may be a good thing, may not be a good thing. That's a whole other area that is uh, just begging for investigation. What I would like to do is take either uh, another population, younger or older, or even go back to the same population and perhaps drill down in even greater detail to find out um, more specifics about their hate behavior. Maybe are they, are they uh, group texting in terms of the types of, of apps they're using. Um, that would be very, very, I think, helpful as well. And, and I think the last thing one could do is really to try and discern how much of the phone is being used uh, for uh, homework because I, I think that's, that's a pretense which might be true, might not be true, that I need the phone to do so much of my work. Um, I, I think maybe the behavior of the phone itself is certainly another area.